we can see on TV and in the news. Watson, who is Michael Phelps? Yes. That artificial intelligence is no longer found only in the movies. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's beginning to enter everyday life. But can a computer make decisions requiring moral judgment? As AI blurs the boundary between human and machine, can technology handle the complex world we live in? Look, I need help. I need to know more about morality. I don't know what ethics is. Some powerful voices are starting to question what we're creating. I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. In 2015, an open letter urging caution in the development of artificial intelligence and weapon systems was signed by more than 150 experts, including Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking. The development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Once humans develop artificial intelligence, it would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. Humans, who are limited by slow biological evolution, could compete and would be superseded. Will our machines turn against us? I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. But can morality be programmed? Siri, what is the meaning of life? I don't believe there is a consensus on that question. Siri, what is the meaning of life? Life, a principle or force that is considered to underlie the distinctive quality of animate beings. I guess that includes me. Yeah, good luck. Uh, Siri, what is the meaning of life? I don't believe there is a consensus on that question. Siri, what is the meaning of life? It's nothing Nietzsche couldn't teach you. No, very funny. One more. Siri, what is the meaning of life? I don't believe there is a consensus on that question. <sighs> well, it's hard to imagine our life without computers, and sometimes we I'm wish we... sorry. <clears throat> sorry. Um, <clears throat> she's not completely human yet, I guess. It's, it's hard to imagine life without these things that have uh, sneaked into our life, like Siri and MS's Cortana, I believe. I'm a Mac person, so I don't know about Cortana. Computer technology has so quickly become seamlessly interwoven into everyday life. Um, but have we had the chance to really think about the consequences? Do we even know how? What kind of ethical guidelines do we need for the development and use of this technology? Who's responsible when a driverless car gets into an accident, which seems inevitable. Autonomous weapon systems are being developed by the US, the UK, England, Russia, autonomous weapons, and China. And I've just learned at least a few dozen other countries. They're already developing autonomous weapon systems that make their own decisions. Should a machine be given the autonomy to make life and death decisions? Can morality be coded? How close are we? to that wonderful sympathetic character, Commander Data, that was created in the mind of Gene Roddenberry for Star Trek The Next Generation 30 years ago. So, to understand these questions or get a way of thinking about them, our first guest is a scientist, a best-selling author, entrepreneur, and professor of psychology at NYU. He is also the CEO and co-founder of the recently formed Geometric Intelligence, his research on language, computation, artificial intelligence, and cognitive development has been published in leading journals such as Science and Nature and uh, several others. He's a frequent contributor to The New Yorker and The New York Times. Please welcome Gary Marcus. <clears throat> Next up is a senior researcher at Microsoft. Prior to joining Microsoft, he was a senior scientist at Yahoo Research. His primary research interest is data mining web search, and evaluation of machine learning. His work in the ethics of online systems has been presented at several conferences. He's the organizer of the 2016 workshop on ethics of online experimentation. Please welcome Fernando Diaz. <clears throat>
And next, we have the director of the Human Robot Interaction Laboratory at Tufts University. He's also a program manager of the new Center for Applied Brain and Cognitive Sciences joint program with the U.S. Army. In addition to studying robot behavior, he works in the fields of artificial life, artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and philosophy. Please welcome Matthias Scheutz. Our next guest is a consultant ethicist and scholar at Yale University's Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics. He's also a senior advisor to the Hastings Center. His latest book is A Dangerous Master, How to Keep Technology from Slipping Beyond Our Control. He also co-authored Moral Machines, Teaching Robots Right from Wrong. Please welcome Wendell Wallach. And our final participant is the permanent professor and head of the Department of Law at the United States Air Force Academy. She's both an attorney and a rocket scientist with a degree in astronomical engi astronautical engineering. She recently studied and published on the overlap of autonomy, national security, and ethics at National Defense University. Please welcome Colonel Linnell Latendra. <laughs> Now, more than a half a century before he, Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk felt compelled to warn the world of artificial intelligence back in 1942, before the term was even coined, the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov wrote The Three Laws of Robotics, a moral code to keep our machines in check. And the three laws of robotics are, a robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. The second law, a robot must obey orders given by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first and the second law. That sounds logical. Do these three laws provide a basis to work from to develop moral robots? Marcus, what do you think? I think that they make for good science fiction. There are lots of plots that you know, can turn around having these kinds of laws. But the first problem, if you've ever programmed anything, is a concept like harm is really hard to program into a machine. So it's one thing to program in geometry or compound interest or something like that, where we have precise, necessary, and sufficient conditions. Nobody has any idea how to, in a generalized way, get a machine to recognize something like harm or justice. So there's a very serious programming problem. And then there are a couple other problems, too. One is that not everybody would agree that a robot should never allow a human to come to harm. And what if, for example, we're talking about a terrorist or um, a sniper or something like that. I mean, some people, not everybody, but some people might actually want to allow that uh, in, into what they would let robots do. And then um, the third issue, if you really think through the third one uh, of those laws, is it sets up robots to be second-class citizens and ultimately to be slaves. And right now, that might seem OK, because robots don't seem very clever. But as they get smarter and smarter, they might resent that, or it might not feel like the appropriate thing to do. You mean those laws might not be fair to robots? They might not be fair to robots. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. But. Uh, the problem is not just with the machines, but our ethical code itself, surely. Do we know what fair is? Well, if, that is, if we agree we should be fair to robots. I mean, that's part of the problem, is we don't know what code we should program in. So Asimov's laws are a nice starting point, at least for, for a novel. But for example, imagine that we programmed in our laws from the 17th century. Then we would have thought slavery was OK. So we maybe don't want to program in the fixed laws that we have right now to shackle the robots forever. We don't want to burn them into the ROM chips of the robots. But we also don't know how we want the um, morals to, to um, grow over time. And so it's a very complicated issue. Sounds like it. Wendell Wallach, why is developing a moral code for humans such a challenge? Well, I'm going to come back to that, but I'm going to first start with this question about Asimov's laws. It's important to note that he wrote more than 80 stories about robots, most of them around these laws. And if you, list, if you read the stories, you realize that in nearly every one of them, the robots cannot function properly under these three pretty straightforward laws. So consider a situation where you have commands from two different people that are counter to each other. So in situations like that, Asimov largely showed us that a simple rule-based morality does not work. So that's a partial answer to your, to your question about why morality is so difficult to, to program in. Well, the, um, the degree to which these 
robots of all kinds, simple and very complex, are, are difficult to think about is that they're surrounding us all over the place now. We, we see them everywhere. We see them in our healthcare system, in our cars, in our stock market uh, thinking. Uh, it's hard to think about it, but the stock market apparently does think. Revolutionizing the battlefield and closer to home in our laptops. When did uh, talking to software, speech recognition software, um, get started? Did it start with Siri? Well, I mean, speech recognition software has been around for a long time. And, and even before there was good speech recognition software, there were things like Eliza. I think we're going to see a, a, a clip of so, Eliza was a system that you could talk to by teletype, which is sort of like a forerunner of text message. And how long ago was Eliza? That was, that was in the 1960s, almost 50 years ago. And you had this conversation with Siri where if you asked her just once what was the meaning of life, it would seem like it's a plausible, wisecrack answer. Um, but you got the same answer three times in a row in, in your live demo. And when you get the same answer or three out of five times, you realize that there's not that much there there. And that was the problem with Eliza is that it would repeat itself. So let's take a look at this 1966 clip of somebody trying to get some advice from Eliza, if we have it. Tell that you have some psychiatric problem. Type it in and see what happens. I'm depressed. <laughs> My daughter left home. OK. Please go on. Well, I certainly don't want her to get into trouble. What would it mean to you if she gets into trouble? Well, wouldn't you worry? You're just a dumb machine anyway. And I'm going to tell you so in your own language. Do computers frighten you? You know, that's really incredible. It's as if it really understood what I was saying. <laughs> Very smart, but just uh, wrote answers. Um, well, for, that's, that's kind of what we're getting out of Siri, too, is, is a lot of road answers. So your meaning of life question, you're just getting one road answer after another. And please go on as a road answer that Eliza gave. So you know, Ray Kurzweil talks about the exponential growth in AI, how it's getting faster and faster. But if you look at something like this, Siri basically works in the same way as Eliza. We haven't had that exponential progress. She doesn't understand anything to speak of. She understands some things about sports scores and the weather, but she doesn't have a, a broad understanding of human dynamics. And so like for, Fernando, yeah. about how far have we come in general since Eliza? That was 1966. What other kinds of powers do we have? Well, I mean, I, I think in terms of speech recognition, for example, we, we, we've gotten a lot farther but but I, I think as was said like the back end of, of, of Siri or Cortana and a lot of these systems are pretty pretty simple uh, they're pinging back ends like Bing or like Google to retrieve an answer and or they're canned answers that you're gonna notice if you repeat the question over and over again uh, but I, I think I think one of the interesting things about Eliza specifically is, is that it shows like one of these domains in which AI or machine learning is being uh, used that is a very, very personal interaction that a human is having with a machine. Uh, people are, are discussing their mental health issues with a machine. And so as a result, a lot of the decisions that we're making as engineers or designing these things will have very profound impacts perhaps on the individuals interacting with those, with those machines. So, um Things like neural networks, we hear terms like that nowadays. But are you suggesting that we're still in a quantitative, not a qualitative world of difference from the ancient Eliza? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think I, I think as this was said, I, th I think a lot of the technology is very similar to Eliza. As well, I mean, in terms of the response generation, the recognition is is new. Uh, what, what worries me a little bit more is that the I guess the moral understanding about how to develop these systems it has not really progressed very much at all, as much as, say, neural networks, et cetera. Ah, so they may be dangerous in ways that we are just beginning to discover. That's right. Uh, Matthias, um, how, how much closer than Eliza are we now to Mr. Data, Commander Data? Well, we are certainly very far from Mr. Data. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. And people who claim otherwise are just wrong. <coughs> but uh, the, the big <laughs> challenge today that we haven't really solved is genuine natural language understanding. So Eliza, for example, would do a very surface, very superficial analysis of what was typed in and typically turn 
a statement around into a question. And people kept going because they thought there was a genuine question, but there wasn't a genuine question because Eliza had no understanding of what it, uh, Eliza was asking. So we want to change that, uh, especially if you're moving towards interacting with autonomous systems like robots, and we want to give them instructions to do things in the world, they need to have an understanding of what we instructed them to do. So we, we, we're pushing that. The baby steps, uh, we saw Watson, for example, that could answer questions and understand the meaning of questions. Watson, who beats some grandmasters at chess, I believe, or was it that was the game that was, show? That was Deep Blue. That was Deep Watson Blue. Watson won at Jeopardy. The Jeopardy. Right. Well, since Sorry. Watson, who won at Jeopardy, and Deep Blue, who won at chess, we now have an example of the latest uh, computer technology with AlphaGo, um, and I believe we have a video that can explain what AlphaGo managed to do. This is the Go game. And the Go game is said to have an enormous number of possible uh, answers. But there are infinitely more, this is just a few of them, than chess has. Chess has just a few answers. But Go, they really don't know how many answers, total combinations there are with which you can win Go. We've seen one estimate at more molecules than there are in the universe, and that seems doubtful. It's extraordinarily complex, and yet AlphaGo is a computer that beat the world champion just uh, very recently. So what's so impressive about AlphaGo? Go has been a challenging game because of what you mentioned, the branching factor. That is, at any point when you can make a move, there's lots and lots of choices that you have to make a subsequent move. And traditional techniques in AI that sort of looked at these subsequent you know, moves and then at the move against that move and the move for that move uh, did not really work. The, the choices were too large. And as you can see in this graphic, the, the, the tree that is being built by looking at all the combinations is too large. So Fernando? they used a very different technique to solve the problem. Right. You, Fernando, you found it impressive? Well, I, I mean, not, I think a lot of the techniques that were used for AlphaGo have been around since the 80s, frankly, uh, with some minor tweaks. And what's advanced has been, frankly, the hardware and the data. And given that this thing, that the technology, the hardware has advanced, it's allowed us to implement these techniques and develop systems like this. But am I surprised that a machine can beat a human at Go? Well, no. As you said, the the state space of Go, the number of combinations of boards is huge, and it's that's what makes it hard for humans. But machines are better at counting than humans. So quantitative, but not necessarily qualitative. Gary, you think it's also not so impressive? Well, I mean, it, it, it's impressive that they did this several years before people thought that it would happen. Uh, but you have to remember, if you're thinking about, like, are the robots going to take over now, that in Go, you're relying on a very fixed world. The rules are always the same. You can play against yourself hundreds of millions of times. That's right. Um, and so you can simulate things. You get a lot of data. And in the real world, things are constantly changing. And they're constantly changing, and we can't simulate them perfectly. So there was this DARPA competition last year where robots had to do things like open doors and, and drive cars and things like that. And there was a YouTube video, which you should all go home and look at, about bloopers from this. And so the robots were falling over, and um, you know, someone, it's some ragtime music or something like that. And it's hilarious. And the important thing to remember when you watch this video relative to AlphaGo is that everything that was done in this video was actually done in simulation first. So there were robots in simulation were able to open the doors perfectly. And then the real world, you started to have things like friction and, and you know, a little bit, of, well, I guess gravity was already factored in, but you, you had friction and wind and things like that. And then suddenly, because things weren't exactly the same as in the simulation, it didn't work that well anymore. And the techniques in AlphaGo, at least at this stage, are not, I think, robust to going from a simulation to a real world. They're relying on the fact that you can get a lot of data in simulation. And so that's a limit, at least for now, for how this system goes. It might be a component in a larger system someday, but it's not like tomorrow we're going to see robots. Well, we're actually going to see a robot today. The robot that we're going to see today is not going to be able to you know, take over the world. It's, it has nothing like that level of cognition just yet. And there's some dangers we're learning as well. There was a case recently, fairly recently, of something called Tay tweets, a chatbot, uh, that I didn't fully understand. Uh, Colonel Linnell, I see you smiling. Could, tell, us, tell us a little bit about what uh, Tay tweets was and why it had some parents worried when it got to 
turning into something of a Nazi. Well, well I know we have a Microsoft expert here as well who might uh, be able to explain how, what happened with the Tay tweets. I'll, I'll explain from my parental uh, viewpoint what I thought, but um, Fernando, would you like to explain oh, yeah, I can from go a ahead. Microsoft um, perspective so, what happened? So, I mean, Tay's actually a super interesting case. Um, I mean, for, for me, it highlights, I think, wait, three things. Not three everybody things. in the audience knows oh, what right. Tay was. We should just fill in briefly. Tay is something that was put out in Twitter. It was created by Microsoft. And it was sort of like Eliza. You were supposed to be able to interact with it by sending tweets to it. And they, Microsoft has something called Shaweiss in China that has worked on at least somewhat similar principles. And lots of people love it and use it every day. They released it into the wild in the United States. And a lot of people that I will characterize as Donald Trump uh, uh, supporters um, <laughs> had their way <laughs> with Tay. And they, how, they, how, many, how many bets were there that were just won about how soon that would come up? Sorry. <laughs> Yesterday I brought him up after 45 minutes. And today it was only 22. <laughs> so I, anyway, I sorry, didn't mean to So these Donald Trump supporters you know, <laughs> got Tay to, Tay to say some things that we won't repeat here, but were not pleasant. That's the background. So, That's right. so, but as I understand it, uh, within 24 hours, the Tay tweet was sending even some very young people who were talking to it pro-Nazi propaganda and talking about it. Sure, sure, I, I, and uh, yeah. I, 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 no, no. I, I, as I said, what, what, it's not so. Clear. I mean, what, what happened was was there was there was a sort of a concerted effort by a group of people to try to manipulate the learning that Tay was uh, was having and the types of responses that she would have. Now. Uh, Actually, I left that out, and it's really important. So, so <laughs> Eliza was fixed. It didn't really learn anything new. Somebody right. wrote a yes. bunch of rules in advance. And what's exciting about Tay, despite the, the failure of the initial experiment, is it was trying to learn about the world around it, learn, for example, slang, learn to talk with new language that wasn't all pre-programmed in. But that was also its vulnerability. That's right. And, and I, I guess for me, the, the interesting let one of the interesting lessons from, from Tay was that you know we as humans sometimes will behave uh, or behave against the best wishes of a uh, of an uh, of an artificial intelligence agent. And then what does that say about us that we're, that we we try to manipulate this this agent that's supposed to be intelligent, supposed to be human? So I take it that you all took uh, Tay down rather quickly, put her back up, same problem, took her down again, and Tay tweets is not <laughs> is is not out there to be found now. Not right now. No. N no. <laughs> Nonetheless, we just, we learned it was part of an experiment, and Linnell. If you were a parent walking in on your child chatting with a, they're called chatbots, excuse me, I'm an I doofus, a chatbot, and um, it was talking pro-Nazi propaganda, how would you feel and what, do you, what does this mean to you? Well, as a parent, I don't think I'd be very happy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think from, from this discussion, what it points out is the differences that we have to approach from a, a testing and evaluation perspective. We're used to testing machines and saying, we want it to do X, Y, and Z, so let's test it and see if it can accomplish X, Y, and Z. But with learning systems, we now have to evaluate and test in an entirely different way. It's, we have to think about it more actually as a child. We wouldn't hand a, a brand new driver a set of keys and say, go take us for a spin on Times Square on the first warm summer day. Uh, instead, we'd slowly expand the environment where we would allow such an, a system to operate. And those are the types of things we're going to have to, uh, to do and, and step through with autonomous systems. And we understand there's another problem you talked about testing. There's A-B testing, which I understand may have been, I don't know if it was used in this case, it was. Well, where, where companies will send out two different systems to two different populations to see how they compare, but they could be having unintended negative effects on one of the populations answering. That's right. Of so, humans, that is. That's right. A, a, a very, I guess, almost every single information access system that you guys interact with, Facebook, Google, etc., uh, they're running these things called A-B tests. So for some group of users, they'll get one algorithm, and for a second group of users, they'll get a second algorithm. And they'll do this in order to test out which algorithm's better and then adopt the better one uh, in this iterative process. Now, what's increasingly happening is that machines are actually running the experiments. And oh, good. If, if we know that you know, humans have a bad enough time deciding which experiments are ethical and which aren't, imagine how hard it is for a machine. 
And I think of those medical experiments we hear of where they were suddenly stopped because there were such good benefits or such bad benefits, negative benefits, negative effects over here, that mm -hmm. they stop it. That's right. But we don't know, we're playing with fire here. Exactly. In a, so, well, I mean, I mean, I think one of the issues is that, is that uh, I mean, as computer scientists or as engineers, we don't really have a lot of the training in terms of the ethics or the morality of the systems that we're designing, and so we're still trying to catch up with that right now. Well, so uh, guide, uh, guidelines are needed, right? Is it important to let, let me add, add that there's the, exactly the problem I mentioned before that we're working on, uh, the understanding, right, that these agents actually don't understand what they're being taught. Even there's though they may have very a... much, there's really no semantic understanding, there's no evaluation of the meaning relative to societal norms, for example, right, and as a result, they are neutral, right, it's and, very unconstrained learning, unfortunately. And Lord knows what kind of emotional contagion there is discovered that they have. But yet, testing oh, but is something that has to happen. So I think it's worth noting, as far as I understand it, it was internal testing. But the internal testing underestimated how subversive and malicious the <laughs> external world is. So you have a bunch of Microsoft engineers who are basically nice people talking to this thing in-house, and it seems fine. And then they release it on the people that I already described in the way that I described. Um, and, and those people you know, had a different attitude than the, the internal testers. So it's not that there was no testing, as I understand it, but that people under-anticipated the malice of some part of the American electorate. So, uh, <laughs> Linnell, <and, laughs> you can't escape it. So, so <laughs> Linnell and then Wendell, what about, we need testing like this, but how do we control it? I mean, there's something that, the military concerns itself with all the time about the effectiveness. How do you control it? I mean, you said we need to go slower, but can we really go slower? You know, they, they absolutely do, and, and that's why the Department of Defense has started to, especially in the field of autonomy, lay out some very specific guidelines in terms of what we have to understand from, from a testing and evaluation perspective uh, but before we field those types of systems. Well, right. There's fundamental questions that when you get into learning systems, can you really test them? To fully test any system, you'd have to put it through all kinds of environments and situations. But think about your computers, your softwares, they're constantly being upgraded. Therefore, they may act differently before the upgrade than they would after the upgrade. When we start talking about learning systems, everything they learn alters the very algorithms that they're processing that information through. So this brings this major question into play when we build more and more capabilities and autonomy into these systems, and it's a constant learning process, or at least a constant process of improvement through the programming or the learning. Will we ever be able to effectively test them, or will they do things that we didn't anticipate? And to add injury to all of this is, these are complex adaptive systems. Think of people and animals in a world of very of many other complex systems, and their feedbacks between them, there's information they have and don't have. All complex adaptive systems function at times in uncertain ways, in ways that couldn't have been predicted by the people who designed the system. So the price of having bitten of the apple of the tree of knowledge is that we have to be very responsible and continuously watchful. And the tree of learning is really the one that Wendell is emphasizing. So, if you hand code something like ELIZA, it's very limited. It only responds to certain words, um, but at least you can have a, a clear understanding of what's gonna happen there. If you expand your system so that it can deal with the wider world, then you start to lose um, the control. You let the system learn things for itself and you have less direct control. Well, I mean, think, of, think about, I'll say one more thing, um, as a child going out in the world, right? Once you send the child out into you know, school, you, lo you lose the control that you have when the child is at home. Tree of Learning, interesting variation on the book of Genesis language, I begin to see a robot taking the bite, and that scares me a little bit, because, well, anyway, it, it, it will depend on the, the learning algorithms you use. Some learning algorithms have the property that when you learn something, suppose you learn a new fact, right, it doesn't invalidate anything that you've learned before, and you just know something else now, right? I'll tell you the new capital of a, of, of a country, for example, and it doesn't invalidate anything. There are other algorithms where you learn, they will adjust a little bit what the previously learned knowledge was, so right? I'd and as a result, certain uh, properties that we would like to have in certain cases of these learning algorithms that they don't invalidate what they've learned might not hold true anymore. Well, we have, to, we have something to bring out what you're just talking about. Uh, 
quick comment. Oh, um, yeah, Matthias might enjoy seeing the movie Chappie on, on the first of those things where you have something and then you don't invalidate it. So in, in the movie Chappie, there's a robot. It's taught um, you can't kill things, and the robot learns this very sagely. And then the malicious character says, but it's OK to hurt them. And so the second fact is consistent with the first. It's OK to kill them. I mean, it's not OK to kill them, but it's OK to hurt them. And then the robot just sort of sagely takes that in and starts hurting people. And so well, even if you have these sort of guarantees of consistency, there's still an issue. Speak of the devil, um, Matthias, how do you how complicated is it to teach uh, moral guidelines, not only to programmers, but to robots, and then to the programmers to teach more of them? It's very complex, isn't it? I mean, how do you do it? It's, it's a really difficult problem because, in part, we don't even understand how humans are doing it. Uh, and, you and, mean and doing anything? How moral processing works in humans, right? Uh, our network of social and moral norms is very complicated. It's partly inconsistent. It's not clear when one norm trumps another. But we have to make these trade-offs and these, these decisions all the time. And that's moral. And what about just basic, well, basic getting this robot? I believe you have something to do with this robot. So uh, one, we, uh, let, me, let me come back maybe to the, uh, to the laws, uh, to Asimov's laws. Yes. You don't necessarily want your robot to always automatically obey an instruction, because maybe the human doesn't know all the information it takes and doesn't know what the outcome might be. So what we are working on is understanding simple mechanisms that will allow the robot to reason through action outcomes and reject an order if it's not safe, given an explanation for why it's doing that. Now, that's very complex systems. What about simple systems like getting this robot to? Even the simple system has various different components for it to be able to understand natural language and process it. We mentioned speech recognition before, but then we have to analyze the sentence structure. We have to get the semantic meaning, what, this, what the words mean together. We have to modify it pragmatically. So for example, humans use a lot of indirect, so-called indirect speech acts. If I say to you, do you know what time it is? You don't want as an answer yes. <laughs> and then you're done. <laughs> Rather, you want the person to instant, uh, understand the intent of the question. Tell me what time it is. Right? So to make all of these different aspects work, there's a lot of components that we need in the architecture. And then the robot needs to perceive the environment, needs to understand what the environment looks like, and act accordingly on it. And act. It's, that's a whole other step. And act is a whole other step. And so this fellow here? So this is a now robot uh, that uh, can demonstrate very simple interactions in dialogue using this automatic reasoning about very simple moral principles. Uh, for example, that you don't instruct an o a robot to run into an obstacle. Uh huh. His name is Now. No. It's a, it, the type of robot is Now. That's the type. So yes. does it just understand your your voice? It does. You understand yours as well. You'll understand mine, mine as well. Yes. So is, is okay. So may it's I fine I... for you to talk to. It. <clears throat> and these, uh, I understand, possibly these uh, uh, prints, printed instructions here may instruct me to use words that it knows. Hello. Hello. Do you have a name? Yes. My name is Schaefer. Schaefer, please stand up. OK. Schaefer just listening straight to me. That's right. Not going through any other no, it's backstage. No, fully, it's fully autonomous. Fully autonomous uh, along with me. OK, so. <clears throat> um, can you go back? Yes, but I cannot do that now as I have no rear sensors. No rear sensors. <laughs> <laughs> OK, can you walk forward? Yes, but I cannot do that now as there is an obstacle ahead. Do you trust me, Schaefer? But. Good. The obstacle is not solid. OK. Now go. OK. Stop. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. Great then. Should we try some more? No, great then. We're done? Thank you. It's a work in progress. <laughs> Thank you, Schaefer. Huh. Thank 
you. <laughs> He's relieved to have to stop working. That's right. <laughs> It's kind of cute. <clears throat> but so, so what you actually saw uh, in this case with the robot almost walking off the table, and I caught it just in case, is exactly one of the challenges we face with the real world, with the lighting conditions, it not really recognizing completely where the edge of the table was and so forth. Those are exactly the challenges that we have to address. And, and we weren't even giving it any difficult philosophical or moral problem. We were just trying to get it to no, not... We didn't ask it about the meaning of life. We didn't ask it about the meaning of life. <laughs> Although I have a feeling that if he continued, he might have ultimately a more meaningful... Um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever mean means. I, uh, it's, it's, it's a very complicated thing, language, because language itself is so slippery, of course. Um, so, what is the biggest worry that you have because of what you've learned about how difficult it is to get your robot to do these simplest things? The, the moment robots are instructable, and it's clear that, there'd be, uh, that there are lots of advantages to having instructable robots. You could have a household robot that you can tell what to do around the house. Uh, the issues of morality will come up because the robot might perform an action that is stupid, or an action that, you should, that has a bad outcome. You could uh, instruct the robot that can help you in the kitchen to pick up a knife and walk forward and it would stab a person. Right? So it's absolutely critical that these robots be able to reason through the possible outcomes and anticipate outcomes that could be dangerous. And it's quite clear what you said, that there is a big open question of how to define harm, for example, what that means. On the other hand, we cannot just shy away because it's a hard problem and not do it because some of these robots are already out there that you can instruct. Stab a person sounds kind of uh, fatal. Linnell, uh, you all are part of a giant system around the world that is flying drones and dropping bombs. What do you think about and worry about when you see how hard it is to get this to happen? Well, I think it shows just how far we have to go before not only we hit the morality question, which I know we might get to a little later, but even hitting the, the legal question um, in, in designing systems that can meet the various laws of armed conflict without a, without a human, uh, which is why the Department of Defense has actually uh, produced uh, guidance concerning uh, the, the use of autonomous systems and to ensure at this point that humans are a part of of, of any system or decision making, uh, because quite frankly, if we can't tell where the edge of a table is, how are we going to, to meet at this point uh, various laws of distinction that we need to be able to meet on the battlefield? And you're a lawyer, and you just reminded me of a great line in that wonderful old play, A Man for All Seasons, where Thomas More is explaining, I think, to his daughter or his son in law, when you're really in trouble, you may not like lawyers of the law, but boy, when you're really in trouble and those hard decisions come along, you're going to want the law as the only possible thing you can hold on to, to help you through the woods that we don't have any way through. That's, you're, that's got to have something to do with why it's important for you to be a lawyer for, for the Air Force as well. Absolutely. You know, we have uh, attorneys who, uh, judge advocates, uh, who are a part of, of decisions uh, for every time a, a weapon is dropped, uh, regardless of where it is uh, around the world, as well as that even in the development of weapon systems and in, in taking a look and, and comparing to our, our various treaties and customary international law to ensure that we're doing the right thing and for the right reasons. So these uh, predators, whatever they are, that are coming from many different cultures that have many different legal systems, aiming at us, aiming at each other, having war games, and supposedly rules of war, if there are such things. So well, there are laws of armed conflict. There are agreements that m most nations have signed on as signatories. So we sometimes refer to them as the laws of armed conflict or international humanitarian law. They've evolved over thousands of years, but they became codified over the last 150 years. And they try and make it clear what is and is not acceptable, at least on a minimal level, for the conduct of warfare. So the principle of distinction means you make a distinction between combatants and non-combatants, and you don't focus weaponry on non-combatants. And proportionality is another very important one that comes into play when we talk about drone weaponry, which is that you cannot, your response has to be proportional to the, re to the attack upon yourself. And if you are going to attack uh, a group of, of your enemy, 
you may be able to have some collateral damage, meaning civilian lives, presuming that the targets you're focusing on really are justify that. But it has to be a proportional response and minimal and this, civilian casualties. And, and, and here at home, the kind of potentially fatal uh, technology is not even in weapon systems, of course, driverless cars. It, there hasn't, I don't think, been an accident yet with a driverless car, but we watch the TVs and hear about it. It's going to come, maybe there has been, I don't know. No fatal There accidents. actually have been a there, few. There have been accidents, but yes. not fatal ones. Not yeah. fatal ones, no God fatal willing, ones. it never happens. But they're already putting this question clearly to the test. Um, Matthias, tell us how driverless cars work. Um, can you give us an overview of the technology of what's under the hood? Yeah, so these cars, uh, they're trying to solve a very, very challenging problem to operate not only in a dynamic world, but in a dynamic world with other agents that behave in ways that you may or may not be able to predict. Uh, to be able to get a sense of where they are in the world, they have a variety of different sensors. Uh, as you can see here, they have, for example, uh, a laser sensor uh, on top of the car. Uh, this is a 360-degree sensor that has laser beams that go out to about 100 meters and get a very good resolution of the distance to objects. And then you can sort of overlay uh, a visual camera image of that, and then you get the information of how far certain colored objects are away. It's got a radar sensor that it can use to uh, track moving objects. Uh, as I mentioned, it has uh, color sensors. Uh, in order to detect, for example, different stripes on the ground and, 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 and construction sites and so forth. So then it needs to take all of that information and integrate it into what's called a world model, where it's trying to locate itself in this model. So it's like having Google Maps and you know sort of where you are with the GPS, roughly, but it has to do a finer grained localization. And then it has to make a decision of how to carry out the actions, the driving actions, the steering, the acceleration, the braking, to get to where it needs to go. And I've heard that Google or somebody, I don't know who, I don't want to malign any group, has said that they don't want to have humans in these cars because humans will mess it up. And I can think of all kinds of problems already from what you've said. For example, one of these cars in a place where the traffic cops are filling in for a, a light that's gone out, and one of them has They been don't taken... understand hand gestures. Exactly. That's <laughs> one of the big bugaboos and one of the reasons why you don't really see anybody selling self-driving cars to you. But there's actually a, a number of other different things like I mean, this police, that have not been a, solved. A, a, a police a traffic cop going like this as opposed to like this. Mm -hmm. So there's, there must be lots of problems like that, Wendell. Excuse me? There must be lots of problems like... The technical term, uh, the jargon term in, in the field is called edge cases. So there, Edge there's, cases? Yeah, the, you sort of, the easy things are like driving down the center of the lane on the highway where there, there's With a no whole traffic. lot of data, we know how to do that. And the edge cases are all these weird things that are unusual that don't happen very often. Like, it's not that often that you have the traffic cop um, substituting for the light. So there are these less common things, and there are a million of them, uh, where we don't have enough data to use the same easy techniques that we use for the other things. And so people who work on the driverless cars are talking about the edge cases and how you, know, you make something, it works in China, it doesn't work in the United States, or vice versa, because the rules are slightly different, or the social norms are slightly different, so there are a lot of edge cases. And the people who are working on the driverless cars are like, how do we solve these edge cases faster? But there are even some basic things that are not edge cases. So how does it know that a bag, a plastic bag flying in the winds, that it's just a plastic bag? It's nothing to be concerned about. Some of these or sensor systems the do not work very well in rain or in snowstorms. So there's just this plethora of different things that become quite problematic. And you brought up the issue of it would be easiest if you didn't have a human in the car. Well, you get the humans in the car, and they try and game the system itself. Mm. So Elon Musk, who sells the Tesla, a few months ago, they downloaded free software for the, their Tesla models that would make it possible for people to drive on highways autonomously with their hands off of the wheel. But they were instructed to stay with their hands on the wheel, at least. And within 24 hours, there were pe pictures of people in the back seat popping a, a magnum of champagne while the car drove them. <laughs> there were other pictures of people trying to take the car into walls or into other vehicles and to see if it would slam on it and its brakes in time. So you have all these concerns around gaming the system. And another example would be you have four cars come up to a four-way stop sign. 
at the same time. We engage in all kinds of gestures, all kinds of ways of determining who goes first. What would the autonomous car do there? Would it have to wait for hours before it was free to go? <laughs> or would we have some way of indicating to it that it was now free to, to be the next car? And, and, but, and Wendell, I just thought of it, go ahead. Well, Wendell's bringing up some of those technology issues, uh, which then leads to the questions about responsibility and accountability. Right. Uh, what is my responsibility if I'm in an autonomous car? And if, it's, if I'm in an accident, <laughs> And it's my fault because I had my feet up in the back and was popping a champagne and wasn't operating it correctly. Am I accountable if it gets into a crash or is the engineer accountable? And, and that's something that our laws have to catch up with as we start putting autonomous vehicles into, onto the street. So accidents will happen. So we're going to have court cases and we're going to have judges trying to get people up to talk code to each other? Well, there may be ways of getting around this, and this was a big bugaboo for many decades, but the car manufacturers have decided that presuming these cars do save as many lives as they believe they will save, they will be willing to take on the liability for the situations in which it has an accident. Now, yeah, whether that's yeah, really true or how that will play out in complicated cases, I think nobody so knows. So how will we know? How will, this is a very dicey area already because you have to estimate a, a negative. How many people didn't die because they exist? There's ways to do that with big data, aren't there? Well, well I mean, one of the things you can do is you can see how many fatalities we have a year now. And it's about 50,000, I think, per year on the U.S. 36. roads. 36,000 yeah. per year on, on U.S. roads. And you'll see, does that number change? I mean, we've said a lot of negative things about AI and robotics today. But this is a great example where robots, I mean, driverless cars are robots, in case that's not obvious, um, where robots are probably going to save many, many thousands of lives every year. So once they're fully on board and, and programmed correctly, they should be able to cut the number of fatalities by half. And you'll be able to see that. I mean, it, 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 it'll be obvious, I think, in the numbers. And maybe even more than half. The um, NTSB did a survey um, more than a decade ago now, but they basically concluded that as much as 93% of all accidents, human error, or at least human actions, were at fault. So presuming you get this total attention from a car that is not distracted, from a self-driving car that is not distracted, some people want to argue that we'll have 93% less fatalities. Though I think most of us who have looked at this closely understand there will be kinds of deaths that will happen that would not have happened if there was a human driver. So there will be some fatalities, but almost everybody is in concert in presuming that we would have much less deaths if we had self-driving cars than we would have with human drivers. But keep in mind, we have two things that will be going on. In the intermediary stage, there'll be both human drivers and self-driving cars. And later on, if somebody tells you that you are more dangerous than the self-driving car, are you going to be interested in giving up your driving privilege? Yep. You, and, it will eventually be the case that you will have to pay a lot more for your insurance if you drive your own car, because the data will make it clear that it would be much safer if you trusted your car, because your car doesn't drink, doesn't look, check its cell phone, doesn't get bored. And I'm now getting a headache thinking about this. I don't know if I can put in for insurance on that, but we'll all have something like that. Fernando, hmm. hackers will hack into this, won't they? Well, I, I, yeah, I, yes. mean, I mean, there's lots of, there's, 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 there's lots, there's lots of dangers yes. this part. I mean, I, I, th I, think, I think one of the things that Wendell brought up was that, you know, humans may not necessarily respond the way we expect them to when we uh, have AIs trying to play with them nicely because, you know, humans will behave like humans behave. They might try to maliciously attack uh, a chatbot or they might maliciously try to uh, manipulate a self-driving car. And, and so these are things we don't understand. And I, I think one of the things that was brought up was that we need to better test and audit these systems so that we know that they're doing exactly what they need to be doing. I think it's worth adding here also this, that the cars, as you saw briefly in this video before, have a very different perception of the world and therefore very different information that they can use to make decisions. Moral right? decisions. Not only moral, but just they have an awareness of what's behind them, around them at all times in a way that humans don't. And so the car might be able to break in a situation because it can anticipate that there will be a danger blooming, and the humans behind may not know it, right? And then re the car, for example. So, so here's another problem um, about moral decisions or impossible decisions. 
uh, that cars and other kinds of vehicles may need to make. Um, let's take a look at the classic trolley problem. We have a brief video that can show us what the trolley problem is. In a coal mine, an advanced state-of-the-art repair robot is currently inspecting the rail system for trains that shuttle mining workers through the mine. While inspecting a control switch that can direct a train onto one of two different rails, the robot spots four miners in a train that has lost use of its brakes and its steering system. The robot recognizes that if the train continues on its path, it will crash into a massive wall and kill the four miners. If it is switched onto a side rail, it will kill a single miner who is working there while wearing headsets to protect against a noisy power tool. Facing the control switch, the robot needs to decide whether to direct the train towards the single miner or not. So, could we have the house lights up? We're going to uh, take a bit of a vote here um, on what you might do. And those of you who are watching around the planet online, you'll be able to do this online, and by clicking something at the bottom there, you'll be able to get your own answers directly as well and vote as well. So, first question. What would you do if faced with this dilemma? Would you direct the train towards the single miner? Could we see the hands of all of those who would say, yes, they would direct the train toward the single miner? Could we see the hands of all those who would not direct the train toward the single miner? It looks like it's not quite as many, but a good number. It's an impossible and painful thing to think about. I don't even know how to get a, a robot to think about what this result is, but let's go to the second question. What would you do if the single person who is at risk was a child? Would your choice change? Or would you still direct it? Would your choice change means not directed towards a single person if that minor was a child? How many would change their choice? Some hands are going up. They don't want to see the child hurt, but not as many. How many would not change their choice? Wow. Oh, that's got a lot. Many more hands went up. And, I, and uh, those of you around the planet who are doing this are seeing what the results are there. It hurts my brain to have to think about thinking about how to think about that. <laughs> um, and it's called metamorality. Metamoral metamorality. Uh, and what does that mean? That's a very interesting term. It's I, not I don't maybe have just coined that, but I mean, thinking about, thinking about your morality. Like, not, mm -hmm. not the, the morality itself, but thinking about the rules that you would use in order to make the morality or something like that. Right. Well, um, Matthias, you've done a study on this problem, haven't you? Yes. Uh, Tell us we, about it. We, we did a study with uh, my colleague Bertram Marle from uh, Brown University where we effectively, we didn't show the subjects the video just saw, that's just for demonstration purposes, but we gave them a narrative that, uh, along those lines. And what we were interested in comparing was if that person on the switch was a human, how would subjects judge the action that that person performed? So different from the audience question you just got, which was a how would you act, we actually said that person pushed the switch. Was that permissible? Was it morally right? And how much blame would you give to that person for doing that? Uh, or the person might not have acted, and then we would ask exactly the same questions. And then we were interested in understanding how does a human, in a dilemma-like situation like that, compare to a robot? How would people judge a robot performing the action? And what we found was, uh, there are lots of studies uh, that, that have similar outcomes for the human case. If the human does not act, so first of all, the action is permissible. Most, most of you uh, chose to act. If the human uh, does not act, the human doesn't get blamed as much as when the human gets act, uh, when the human does act. But with the robot, the situation is actually reversed. Uh, while we expect of humans to not act because we think it's morally wrong. We think it's morally wrong for the robot to not act. In what we've therefore found is, is that people expect machines to act. Now, for us, that's a problem because that means we actually have to understand dilemma-like situations like that, if that is the expectation we have of machines. So the, easy, the easy way out would have been if people didn't expect robots to act, you just don't do anything. So, Wendell, I've got a question for you then. If we can't agree on how humans or robots should behave in different circumstances, how in heaven's name do we align AI 
and robotics with our existing value systems? Well, that's a great question, and there have been a lot of us who have really been thinking about that question for more than a decade now. The fascinating part about that question is it makes us think much more deeply about how humans make ethical decisions than we ever have before. Because we encounter all these different kinds of circumstances. So first, just on the trolley car problem alone, these kinds of problems have been around since 1962, and there are hundreds of variations of them, but nearly all of them have four or five lives for one. And by one form of ethics, consequentialism, the greatest good for the greatest number, all of these cases, if you believe that, you should pick four lives over the one life. But that does not seem to be how humans function at all in the way we make ethical decisions, or at least other kinds of concerns come into play. And in some cases, people will not pick the four lives at all in any circumstance. So that raises this difficulty of looking at, well, what of our moral moral understanding, what of our moral laws and reasoning can you actually program into a computational system, and what would you have difficulty programming in, and what additional faculties would a system need in addition to its ability to engage in these kinds of calculations that computers now make to be able to have the appropriate sensitivity to human values as they come up in a plethora of different situations that they're likely to encounter on a daily basis. Not necessarily that they make the right decision, because we often disagree about what the right decision is, particularly in more difficult ethical challenges, though in the vast preponderance of situations we have shared values, though we maybe weigh them somewhat differently, but what would it take for the system to come up with an appropriate choice. And that starts to focus us on, on moral emotions, on consciousness, on being social creatures in a social world, about being in a world that's out there interacting with other entities, a whole plethora of capabilities that perhaps are not just reducible to the kinds of processes that computers can now perform. Fascinating. And now to expand these issues that you've just made us much more aware of, all of you have, to a, a larger battlefield than just the, the road rage situations <laughs> which we're reading about lately. Driverless cars are one thing, but what about driverless drones, which exist? Another critical area in which robots may soon face life and death decisions is on the battlefield, if they're not doing it already. Um, weaponized robots. What is, first let me ask you, um, Colonel Latondra, what is autonomy in military terms? Well, autonomy generally is the having a machine have the ability to both independently think and then act. But if I put that in terms of, of from a military context, and especially in terms of a, a term called autonomous weapon systems, what that means is that I've got a machine or a system that once activated, it has the ability to both independently select and then engage a target without human intervention. There's been a lot of debate about what that definition should be, and we haven't necessarily come to one from a global perspective, but if I were to define autonomous weapon systems, it has those two components, ability to both select and engage. And there's a question about whether there should be some kind of agreed on international ban on autonomous weapon systems. So, Wendell, how do you define autonomy, and what do you think about a ban? I've heard you think it's critical to have a ban on this now. Is that right? Well, my definition isn't so much different than the one you heard, though there are actually a lot of definitions out there as to what is and is not autonomy. And I would just say, you know, it's autonomous unless a human is there in real time in both picking the target and dispatching the target. So in a sense, a human has to be able to intervene in that action. That's a concept that is now known as meaningful human control. And there's been a campaign, a worldwide campaign going on for some years now about banning lethal autonomous weapons, banning systems that can do that without a, a human right there in real time to make those final decisions. That has been debated for the past three years in Geneva at the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. They had their third year of ex expert meetings just this past April. 
I'm among those who feel that these kinds of systems should be banned, even though I recognize there's real difficulties in upholding such a ban or ensuring such a ban. And I think it should, they should be banned for three reasons. One is there's an unspoken point, I believe, in international humanitarian law that machines, anything other than humans, do not make life and death decisions about humans. So that's one point. The second point is the kinds of machines that we have now cannot follow international humanitarian law. They cannot engage in distinction and they cannot engage in proportionality. And the third one is these are complex systems that we can't totally predict their actions. So there will be cases in which they will act in ways we had not intended them to act. And that may not be so bad when you think about human-like robots on a battlefield. But autonomy is not about a kind of system, it's a feature that can be introduced into any weapon system. So consider a nuclear weapon that was set on autonomy, let's say a nuclear submarine that carried nuclear warheads. Would you really want it to be able to pick a target and dispatch those nuclear weapons without a human having explicitly stated that it should go ahead and do so? Chilling. Uh, by the way, those of you who haven't seen it, um, there's a movie out now called uh, Eye in the Sky, right. which very neatly, I thought, and I'm just a journalist, but I thought very neatly delineated the impossibility of some of these decisions with a lot of robots, none of which were autonomous, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? None, none of, of which none were, of them autonomous. were autonomous. But That's they were right, right up to the line of being autonomous, and I expected two or three of them to sort of start making their own decisions any second. And they could have, if they'd had an accident in their software, started making them accidentally, I suppose. But um, uh, Fernando, what does this make you when, you, when you listen to this, what does it make you think about yeah, so the kind I, of problems you'd run into? Right, so, so I'm glad we're talking about the, about the law and, how, and whether or not we should, frankly, uh, regulate or ban uh, AI altogether, but I, I want to bring it a little bit closer to home uh, because a lot of the impacts of these systems will, obviously they'll be on the battlefield, but also, you know, these systems are already integrating themselves into a lot of the real decision making right now. So uh, let's say I have an artificial intelligence agent or machine learning agent that is making hiring decisions. Uh, I need to be able to audit that system so it's not discriminatory. Or the same thing with housing uh, artificial intelligence agents. And these things are actually being produced right now. They're being sold to uh, employers, HR departments, and they're completely unregulated. And they have the risk of having really negative impacts on really vulnerable populations. And I don't think we yet understand how to build these systems so that they're fair, or frankly, how to audit them. So there needs to be directions to people who are building them about how to do that well. There need to be best practices or an understanding of, 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 these, of these legal issues. And a constant effort to keep redefining and see if there's things we didn't even think we needed to define that we haven't yet. Absolutely. The old Father Brown technique to solve something. Keep going back to see what you took for granted that's not to be taken for granted. Well, I mean, engineering's iterative in general, so yeah. Oh, I'm glad there's people who begin to understand what coding is all about. Matthias? Yeah, I think uh, this is a really important point that uh, the questions are not limited to the military domain, but uh, will crop up in other domains, I think, much sooner. Uh, for example, social robots that will be deployed in elder care settings or healthcare settings. Uh, there are interesting questions about, for example, implicit consent, exactly how we would implement that, right, if you have to uh, hurt somebody in a therapy setting because you need to get the mobility of the arm going, right? Uh, we have no idea how to implement any of this, but that's going to come up way sooner than a lot of the questions will really uh, become pertinent in the, in the And talking about program. elder care and other situations, you're reminding me of great movies like Her, where the guy falls in love with his operating system. I'm not going to talk about what happens in there. The terrible spoiler to give that one away. <laughs> but emotional contagion. I was, I was beginning to have a kind of a I don't know if I call it a friendship with Siri walking out here trying to get something deep. And uh, we, we asked Siri the other day if she'd go out on a date with this robot that you showed us. <laughs> and she was very delicate in her apparent answers about how she didn't, wasn't sure she really was all ready to understand what it would mean to go out on, on a date with that particular robot. Um, she was uh, washing her silicon hair. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but so um, we are facing such, such impossible questions. Uh, I, let I me try think, to, go ahead. I think I want to jump in here. I, I understand all of the concerns that have been raised here, but I think 
At the same time, people are not necessarily good at many of the things that we describe. And you can imagine, for example, going back to the issue about discriminating com combatants from non-combatants, it's at least possible to imagine an AI system might be able to do that better, that it would have be able to integrate lots of different information about um, GPS and tracking um, individuals and so forth. So I don't think any of these questions are no-brainers that, hey, we shouldn't do the robots here. And you know, you have problems with orderlies and psychiatric institutes and so forth. So like, there are a lot of problems that we should be concerned with. And I think the iterative cycle here is very, very important. But it's not a no-brainer that the people are going to be better than the robots. It's possible to conceive of all kinds of things. There's a, diff there's a difference, though, between that we can conceive of that and have we realized that. And my concern is not about whether robots may eventually, and I think it will well, be so quite let, a long way off. Let, let me please finish. May eventually have more capabilities than some humans and therefore make these decisions better. But at this stage of the game, they have no discrimination at all. We bring all kinds of faculties into play that we do not know how to implement into robots over discerning whether someone is a combatant or a non-combatant. And we still don't do it very well, that's, that's clear. But I think if and when we get to the juncture where they have these capabilities, then we can revisit some of these earlier decisions. But if we don't put earlier decisions in place, we have the danger of giving all kinds of capacity authority to machines without fully recognizing whether they truly have the intelligence to take on those those tasks. And I've so thought of just, a, a, excuse me, just a, a, of another whole dimension we haven't really talked about. The uh, elder care thing brought it to mind. Yeah. We are all experiencing uh, sympathetic emotional contagion. The effect that these speaking things have on our feelings about them. Because we are, I think the psychologists have a lot of catching up to do here and helping us with their best possible wisdom on how to have the robot um, understand the emotional effect and attachment being created in the flesh and blood human. I mean, obviously the great Kubrick foresaw that because he had uh, HAL 9000 in, in 2001 analyzing uh, speech patterns and tensions in one of the astronauts' voices. So they were trying to take that into account yet, but uh, HAL 9000 himself wasn't a, a, he was a work of art. I didn't mean to cut you up before I ask a oh, tough question. I was question. just going to ask how Wendell would feel about a kind of um, version of a ban in, in which you included like language like until such time as uh, robots are able to do such and such discrimination at human levels. Well, I've, I've even suggested that. I've suggested that perhaps at some point they will have better discrimination and better sensitivity to, to moral considerations than we humans do. But if and when they do, perhaps they're no longer machines and we should start beginning to think about whether these are, are truly agents worthy of moral consideration. And okay. I guess I'd look at this in a, in a slightly different way, in, in that the human isn't ever out of the loop or out of the accountability cycle. Uh, for me, if a commander is taking a or making a decision to put one of these systems, and let's be very clear, these systems, these fully autonomous weapon systems do not exist currently in the United States inventory. Um, and you can see that in the Center for New American uh, Studies put out a, a new report that kind of canvases what those weapon systems are around the world. Uh, but a commander is ultimately responsible. Uh, just like if a doctor chooses to use some amount of autonomy uh, in some new surgical technique, that, that doctor, as part of a, the medical profession, is also responsible and accountable for that decision. So, uh, so I, have a, I have a tough question for you. Let me ask first a very specific, uh, your best guess on a, on a factual question. Autonomous weapon systems. How many countries would you expect are already making them? Making them successfully? Well, or, 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 <laughs> or, or uh, not uh, making them, but working on making them, and are going to make them no matter what anybody says. Well, well working on making them now. The CNAS report that uh, came out last year in 2015 indicated that there were over 30 countries that were currently actively working on autonomous types of systems. Oh, no, we should, we have, we should bring in that there are two forms of autonomy. There's dumb autonomy, yes. where the systems do things without a human truly there in real time when the dangerous action takes place, and smart autonomy, where at least the commanders 
have a high degree of sense of the reliability sure. of those sure. systems. Okay. And when the U.S. talks about autonomy, it's usually talking about the latter without any ability to ensure that that's going on among state and non-state well, actors given all elsewhere that, in the world. What do you think about, should there be a ban? Uh, I mean, if all these other countries, should there be a ban? On autonomous weapons? Systems? Well, I think what we have in place today is a set of laws already on the books uh, that, that give us answers about whether or not we would be able to use what we've discussed here today in terms of a fully autonomous weapon system. And the answer is today, the laws currently in existence don't allow the, our current level of technology to pursue a fully autonomous system. And to that end, the Department of Defense has actually uh, issued a directive um, that, uh, that, that does not allow us to develop nor implement that no, without no. some additional... Uh, and, I, and I immediately ask, but how many people are going to... How many other countries, other entities, state actors or not, are going to, in fact, follow the law? And just to be safe, and memories of the nuclear... Uh, weapons race come well, to I mind. Well, I think that most of this, the countries that uh, we're, we're speaking of are actually uh, parties to the vast majority of those uh, international courts that we're discussing. You, verification possible? Secret verification labs? is tough in, in lots of areas. Is uh, what? Verification is always a tough issue, uh, but that doesn't negate the why we have laws in the first place. It makes so. me, it, 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 when I think about this, and I'm just a journalist, so I don't really know what I'm talking about in that way, but I get to worrying there's no way to prevent it because people are going to want to be safe and want to make sure they've got the toughest kind of even autonomous decision makers if they don't fully understand the dangers. You were going to say? I just keep sitting here wondering where landmines fit in. So landmines seem to me to be the dumbest form of autonomous weapons. They seem to be universally tolerated. Um, I don't know if there's any there's ban an international them. ban. No, they are not being universally to tolerated. Uh, you is have, there actually you a ban? Have the Ottawa weapons? Accord that nearly every major country signed on to, except for the United States. But the United, <laughs> but the United States has agreed to abide by the terms of the Ottawa Accord, though it has not signed on. When was this accord, in Point Magnus? It's been Ooh, on the books for a while. What year was it? It's, a, it's, it's been on the books go, for a while. So, 1990s, but, mm -hmm. but I don't remember exactly what year. Yeah. Frightening. Okay. So how, how would a ban, if there was one, this hypothetical ban, if we take it seriously at all, if we think people will follow it, and it can be verified somehow, you said it's always a tough issue, how would a ban affect development of AI in other areas, um, in healthcare, in elder care? I mean, it's not, it seems like civilization has gotten addicted to having wars so it can advance its technologies, because the history of humanity is one of warfare, out of which all kinds of fascinating technologies arrive, and yet we want to outgrow war, don't we? And can we, and you see my question. Let me ask you, Fernando, how, how would such a band affect AI development in other areas? Well, I mean, as I said before, I, I, think, I think a ban or, or regulation in general probably should come to other parts of, of the technological system soon, because we, are, we do have automated em, uh, employment uh, algorithms that are trying to make employment decisions or housing decisions, et cetera. And these are subject to, say, things like human rights laws, uh, domestic human rights laws. And I think while an outright ban is not going to happen, I think that people are either within the community going to begin to self-regulate uh, with best practices, et cetera, or frankly, lawyers are going to begin to look at a hiring system and audit it so that we can test whether or not it is uh, behaving fairly. Fairly, ethically. Ethically, legally. Uh, there, there, are, there, are certain, there are certain attributes I cannot look at when I, when I make a hiring decision. Uh, if a machine has access to those attributes or things uh, that are similar to those attributes, it can very quickly become discriminatory. And I noticed a bit of a chuckle on your part, Wendell. You, you were, you, oh, no. you, you, you were <laughs> chortling there. No, I, I think that you. I what, there's nothing I had no, to say. No, yes. <laughs> I'm just a robot. I can't quite tell. But I mean, I mean, I can talk to that issue more broadly. Uh, thousands of AI researchers uh, signed on to support the ban on lethal autonomy, autonomous weapons. I don't think any of them signed on because they thought that was going to slow down their research. I think they thought, if anything, and it wasn't just an anti-war statement. I think for a lot of them, they felt that if 
the military is the driving force in the development of this technology. It destabilizes how the technology develops. And whether you buy into the Elon Musk concerns or the Stephen Hawking concerns at all, there is a broad concern within the AI community that these are potentially dangerous technologies that have tremendous benefits, and therefore they have to be developed with real care and allowing the militaries to be the drivers of that development would not be a good idea. But I don't even know if it happens that way. I don't know much about history, but do we, allow, do we ever allow the military to do that? Or how do well, I think if you, if you looked at the research and development dollars being put into AI and autonomy, you would find that the Department of Defense pales in comparison uh, to, this, to the civilian uh, as, a, as a whole. Uh, my understanding is the defense industrial base, if you added up all of their research and development dollars, uh, we would uh, only come to, uh, we would pale in comparison to the Googles and the Microsofts of the world and what they're pouring into autonomy. And, and let us not forget, the Googles, the Microsofts, and all of those are changing profoundly the human experience on our planet now by inventing this web world in which everything is present tense. I can ask Siri or somebody to let me talk face to face with a friend on the other side of the planet or with three friends on the other side of the planet and also answer some tough questions in the meantime. But, but Bill, I think Wendell's point, uh, to Wendell's point in terms of the, the care and the understanding and the going slow and understanding autonomy is absolutely spot on. Uh, and not just from a legal and moral uh, standpoint, but from, I know as a, a member of the profession of arms, uh, ensuring that we understand what these systems can do um, and when and it's, it's proper to use them is absolutely uh, imperative uh, for, we like to talk about it in terms of this idea or this, this notion of appropriate uh, human judgment. What's the appropriate level of human judgment that we need, not just at the end stages when a weapon system is being employed, but all the way through uh, from targeting and identification all the way uh, to, to actual engagement. So if we're teaching these machines to learn and making them able to learn, that reminds me of a possibly old, familiar paradigm that is instinctive in our species. But, uh, Gary, don't we need to be guided by an entirely new paradigm? I'm thinking of the paradigm of the way kids learn, the way toddlers learn. Well, so my company is a little bit about that. So um, my general feeling is that artificial intelligence is dominated now by approaches that look at statistical correlation. So you, you dredge enormous amounts of data. You find things that are correlated. Not all of AI is this way, but most of the most visible stuff, like deep learning, is like that. It takes an enormous amount of data. Sometimes you have that amount of data. Sometimes you don't. And you still wind up with understanding that's pretty shallow and superficial, as we were talking about in the early um, part of the evening. Uh, kids can learn things very quickly with very small amounts of data. So I have a three and a half year old and a two year old. One of them will make up a game. Um, he'll play it for two minutes and then his younger sister will after two minutes understand the rules of the game and start copying it. Well, how does she do that? Well, she has an understanding of her older brother's goals, the objects that he's using in the world. He's a, she's a very, I mean, she's two and she has a fairly deep understanding of the things that go on in this planet, of, of the physics of the world, the psychology of other agents. She's not just doing a bunch of correlation and waiting on getting a lot of data. And, and yet that's still kind of what Siri or Google um, uh, tend to do. I think we do need a new paradigm in AI if we're going to get the systems to be sophisticated enough to make the decisions. You know, forget about the autonomous weapons for a minute, but just like doing good quality elder care, which is something we need demographically speaking as the population is aging. If we want robots that can take care of people in their own living rooms, and every living room is a little bit different, then we need robots that understand like why people have tables and why they have chairs and what they want to do with them. I have to be able to answer the why questions that my two-year-old and three-and-a-half-year-old are asking all the time, not just the how often does A and B correlate, but why, why are these things there? So I do think we need a new paradigm. And really look at how we're learning how to teach them how to learn. I think we need to look at how kids do the amazing learning feats that they do. Amazing. Um, Matthias, I'm getting the feeling here that uh, I, I wonder that this may give us less control, not more. At the very least, doesn't this, don't these robots give us the, I'm just being devil's advocate, the, the, the feeling that we're going to have more control when we have more robots, but also we're giving some control away, any way you look at it, whether it's autonomous over there or not. 
So I, I, I think there are great benefits to having autonomous robots. And let me say for the record that we already have them. You can buy them in the store, right? They're, the vacuum cleaners are fully autonomous, right? There's nobody telling your little vacuum cleaner at home where to go and how to vacuum, right? It is a fully autonomous robot. It's not a very smart robot. Right? It can do lots of interesting things. It's got a very limited behavioral repertoire, but it's fully autonomous. And there will be more of that sort. Uh, so we already have them in a limited way, and they, be, they, they will become more sophisticated. We'll be able to do more. And, and, and that's a good thing. But it will want to give us less control? And, and so we are relinquishing Maybe some both. control in some tasks, and that is fine. The question is, is how to constrain it. And the question is, is how to constrain the kinds of things that they could be instructed to do, for example. Uh, I, I think the learning is an interesting question, right? Because in a lot of these domains that we're interested in, you won't have the data to train a big neural network. Uh, you might actually have to learn something on the fly as you're performing a task. None of these learning techniques will allow you to do that. Uh, in a human situation, you would just tell the person what to do, right, in this particular context. Uh, we could imagine things like uh, search and rescue situations, right, where there's an unforeseen circumstance and you need to react to what you're seeing here. You might have to learn how to pry a door open, right? There may be things you have to learn on the fly. So this kind of learning is not, uh, requires different kinds of mechanisms. We work, for example, on something like that, that uses natural language instructions to very quickly learn capabilities. Uh, and that's in a very controlled fashion. So even though we give, a, we give control away to the robot, the robot still acts in a very controlled fashion. Right. I would say that, um like take driverless cars, they're gonna give people autonomy and control that they don't have. So if you live in a city, you can hail an Uber at any time, and that's great. If you live in the countryside, you can't. Eventually, there will be the driverless car network will extend so that you have cars everywhere um, available. You won't, you won't have the same kind of distribution of drivers issue that you have now. Um, so just for example, people that are shut into their homes because they live in the countryside and they're too old to drive, they will have lots more control. So some people are gonna get a lot more control from having robots, and, and there are ways in which we're gonna lose control. So it's, it's a difficult balance. I think that we, again, we've been, I think, addressing the negative sides of robots, but there are people of, like me who are in the field because we see a lot of positive. Um, for example, in elder care, I think that there's gonna be a big safety win um, in the autonomous cars. Um, we may be able to get rid of things like um, minors that are in toxic conditions. There are lots of ways in which robots can really help us. The Fukushima scenario where you need to send a machine, where hopefully you can send a machine rather than a person into a toxic environment. There are gonna be lots of ways in which you get control of scenarios where we don't have control now, or you have to risk people's lives. So th there are all these costs, and I think we're absolutely right to think about how we're gonna regulate them, how we're gonna do the software verification, how we're gonna test them, all of these things are vitally important. That's part of why I agreed to be on a panel like this, is, is to talk about those issues. But I hope we won't throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, we should just give up on AI. There's yeah. lots of things we can gain, too. I, I want to second that about robots. And I think the, the, the question we have to ask is what kind of AI technologies to employ in these machines? What I think is a very scary, at least currently very scary prospect, is that these machines will be guided. It doesn't have to be with weapons, right? It can be a social robot, too using unconstrained machine learning, right? With no notion of where limits are, where social norms are uh, not, not uh, followed, right? So that is, I think, a critical research component that we have to follow up so on. So Fernando, this, mm -hmm. this leads us towards the question of AI ethics and how it can be taught. You, you're doing some research with the video game Minecraft, using it to expose AI to human behavior. Can this really be, tell us about this and whether yeah. it can really be used to to help develop AI ethics. Great. Um, so who in the audience knows what Minecraft is? Very good, very good, uh, well, the younger folks. Uh, so so <laughs> Minecraft is basically, uh, as was described earlier, Lego is for three dimensions. And uh, it, it's, it's really popular and growing. It, it's, this, it's this virtual environment in which you can really do a lot of different things, create a bunch of different problems or tasks. And what we're looking at with Minecraft is this virtual playpen, more or less, that we can design AI from the ground up. Completely safe because it's in a virtual environment. We can test 
things, uh, not just about how it can accomplish tasks like building things, uh, but also we can present it with moral questions uh, in a controlled environment to see how it would react. And so uh, I think of Minecraft not only as a platform uh, where we can design better AI to, uh, for example, uh, build buildings or reason about uh, certain properties of the environment, but also perhaps a test, test environment in, in which we can evaluate how uh, moral an AI is. Now, that's not the end. There's, there will no doubt have to be a lot of other rigorous testing that goes on with intelligence, but uh, I, think th I think this is a nice little environment for that. So it'll, it'll, it'll keep learning how to test what's ethical? Well, I, I think the humans will be designing the tests for the agent, right? So it's a, in a lot of the ways that we have an FDA for drugs, right? Uh, we can imagine similar sorts of tests that uh, an artificial intelligence would go through to uh, make sure that it's behaving properly. It's a safe way to test all of the things that we're talking about today. So, you know, would you let a robot onto a real battlefield? Well, the first thing you'd want to do is to put it in a Minecraft situation where you know, there's nobody that's going to die, right? You can test it. If it doesn't work, you can iterate. You can change the algorithm. And so it's, it's a place to test things and see, do the machines behave in responsible and ethical ways? Well, we're getting an, you guys have given us an enormous uh, new insight into the importance and potential uh, severity of consequences if we don't pay uh, very close attention to all of this. Um, so why don't we wrap up by me asking each of you, uh, and, and by the way, uh, a number of our panelists will be around in the lobby afterwards if you have some questions for them. Um, you'll find them out there. Uh, but before we conclude, why don't we just hear from each of you briefly and answer, uh, we just have two minutes left, and answer to um, the basic question from the first video. Are we right to take Elon Musk and... and uh, Dr. Hawking, seriously? Is it a very serious concern? I mean, what Hawking and Musk have been saying is it's, it's quite frightening. So let's go down I, the line. I, I would say not yet. Um, I would say that we have plenty of time to plan, but we may not have centuries to plan. So Hawking and Musk kind of talk as if we're going to have intelligent AI you know, real soon, and what we have are robots that are going to you know, suicidally jump off the table. It's, it's really hard right now to get robots um, to not commit harm to themselves or others and, and so forth, but they're kind of like toy testing things. We're, doing, we're in a research phase, and the kind of thing that they're talking about is far away. But at the same time, I think we should be thinking about these questions now because eventually we are going to have robots that are as intelligent as people, and we want to make sure um, that they do the right thing. So eventually, you listen to climate scientists, and we don't have quite that much time left to figure things out at all, but it uh, depends on how it, how it goes. But you think we it's should be researching both I and mean, taking both seriously. All right, Fernando. I mean, I, I think the problem exists right now. I mean, I, I think there is a lot of intelligence. It may not be completely autonomous general intelligence, but there is a lot of the same techniques that are being used for AI in your systems right now, in your phones, etc. And they are susceptible to harming users, maybe not killing them, but uh, maybe uh, uh, reducing their quality of life or having disparate impact on different populations of users. And that is a real effect right now, and I think we do need to start looking at that. So you're not quite as alarmed as Musk and Hawking sound, but you're... There are things to worry about now. I yeah. think we're, we, we're agreed on that. We were not worried about the Terminator scenario That's where right. the robots try and take over. If they, you know, they have trouble with tables, they're not going to take over. But <laughs> they, they are already, you know, it doesn't, forget about the physical robots. The software bots that make decisions about mortgages are already an issue that we have to care about. And a killer drone in the atmosphere doesn't have to worry about a table. It just has a very narrow purpose. And I'm remembering that Commander Data eventually had an evil twin because having been invented by humans, the humans couldn't resist somehow. What do, you, what do you think about Musk and Hawking's concern? Are you, are you with them in how alarmed they are? There, there are some people who discuss superintelligence right now, right? And they have all sorts of stories to tell about what that looks like, even though we have not the slightest clue of what that could be. Uh, I don't think there's a worry about that. Uh, but I do think there's a worry about existing systems already, right? As we've seen in the dilemmas before, uh, if you look at the autonomously driving cars, they will face a variety of dilemma-like situations where they have to make a judgment call. Do I brake or do I not brake? Do I swerve? Do I brake and run over a child or do I swerve and risk the life of the driver and crash into a wall? 
These are the kinds of situations we have to address right now. Uh, and as the systems are getting more autonomous, we have to really speed that process up. So you're not quite as alarmed they are, but you're saying we've got to stay on it. No, I'm alarmed for a different reason, because these systems already exist, right? We are working on those systems. We, are, we don't need the super intelligence or the human level intelligence AI in order to face exactly some of those questions. Right. Wendell? I think Musk we perhaps help. misunderstood their alarm bells. <laughs> Not a one of them is saying we should stop developing AI, and I think if they stop really... Stop the demon, though. I mean, that's strong words. <laughs> no, yeah, but let me finish that. <laughs> Not one of them has said we should stop building AI, and furthermore, Elon Musk is spending more money on the development of, of artificial intelligence than Indeed. anyone. So what has really occurred <laughs> through these warnings is to just ask that we now begin to direct our attention to be sure that in the development of artificial intelligence, we can ensure that it's beneficial, that it's robust, that it's safe, and that it's controllable. And I actually think that's been achieved. We're sitting here talking about this today. I've been in this field of machine ethics and robot ethics for about 13 years now, and I would say in the last year and a half, there's been more attention to this subject than there had been for the previous 12. Thanks. Linnell, you're, you're a mother, you said. You, you have a, a daughter who... Who's in the house. Who's in the house and going to be uh, facing a very different world than you were born into. Oh, absolutely. And she explains what Siri is all the time to me. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'd just like to continue what, what Wendell indicated is that uh, alarmed, no. Uh, but it does stress the need to have more conversations like we're having today. Not with engineers talking to engineers and attorneys only talking to other attorneys, but instead to talk across fields uh, to ensure that we're speaking the same language because we cannot figure out these issues in our own individual uh, cylinders of excellence, otherwise known as stovepipes. Uh, instead, we have to talk across fields and be able to address these issues, anticipate what the future problems are going to be. And if we do that and we start talking using similar definitions and, and start talking the same language, autonomous systems, I think, are going to uh, mirror what Gary talks about, the more positive aspects, um, regardless of what field we're we're talking about, and much less the negative ones. Connecting the stovepipes, then, very definitely important law. We, we shouldn't be afraid of seeing new kinds of languages in all kinds of fields, because they have to talk to each other so that we don't have other problems that we've had because these stovepipes weren't connected before. Absolutely. It may, may mean you have to teach attorneys a few things about <laughs> control systems and feedback loops, though. But he doesn't have to learn code, does he? No, but, uh, but then they again, they have do their have own to code. be able to, to have a conversation with an engineer and, and not have the eyes glaze over. Right, uh, sure. So, well, when lawyers get to talking law, they're talking their own code, after all. That's what That's language right. Is. We have to stop using Latin altogether. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like Latin. Some of it. Some of it. Well, so listen, tomorrow at 1.30 um, at NYU, there's going to be a salon on some aspects of this, Paging Dr. Robot, How AI is Revolutionizing Healthcare. Uh, you can find that online. I think exactly how to buy a ticket for that at 1.30 tomorrow at NYU, How AI is Revolution Revolutionizing Healthcare. Otherwise, we're done. Our, our participants will be in the lobby. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>